Support for this podcast comes from Frito-Lay in the 2023 Snack Bracket Championship. The Frito-Lay Snack Challenge is underway, and fans are voting on their favorite snacks to crown champion. We're talking about primetime matchups between the best 64 snacks in the land. Will Ruffles Ridges reign supreme? Can Doritos defend their dynasty? Or will Smart Food use their smarts for a surprise upset? Only you can decide. Get in on all the action for a chance to win up to $1,000 or a year's worth of snacks. Let your snacks be heard. Just go to frito to vote and enter for a chance to win. No purchase necessary. Three stakes ends April 3rd, 2023. Void but prohibited. Years worth of snacks awarded in the form of 52 coupons, each good for one bag of chips. See official rules at frito Welcome to the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. My name is Jeff Sharon, along with Eric Lopez. And, uh, you know, it's May. This is our first show in the month of May, Eric. We've been doing this since the beginning of last August. So this is month number nine, man. Um, unbelievable how, how, how far things have come already. And here we are winding down the spring, and we're already seeing some big football news. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, Jeff, since it is nine months since we've done this, when do I get to renegotiate and get an extension? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Contract. Here, 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 here you go. Right now, ladies and gentlemen, Eric Lopez, congratulations. <laughs> You've officially been offered an extension <laughs> to continue hosting, <laughs> the, co-hosting yeah. the Black and Gold Banneret podcast, if you so if you so accept. There you go. Yeah. It's leverage, baby. All right. We're in, baby. All right. Here we go. Hey, we, That's so right. Because, you know, if you didn't give me that extension, I was I was, I was going to try and negotiate to join Nightline. So I, that, yeah. that. <laughs> it's a crowded house over there, but okay. Uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> We've got a bunch to talk about, actually. Uh, we're actually going to start with some football. We're going to talk uh, about the uh, NFL draft. We, we kind of um, – we're going to wrap the NFL draft in guys who got picked. Well, the guy who got picked, Shaquille Griffin. Guys who got picked up in free agency. Uh, we're going to talk about Scott Frost getting a contract extension through 2021. Uh, we're also going to talk about uh, maybe some guys who didn't get picked up. Uh, and we've got some news from baseball, softball, and uh, golf to talk about. So um, pretty busy show considering that it's May. Graduations are happening. Commencement's happening at UCF. And, Guys, uh, you know, some of uh, the student athletes that we've known for four or five years, they're picking up their de- their degrees now. They're moving on to, you know, the real world. And, um, you know, speaking of people who got handed pieces of paper that cost a lot of money, Scott Frost signed a contract extension. Uh, we're recording this Thursday, May 4th. He signed it today through the 2021 season. Uh, the, the quote from Scott Frost was uh, – I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to continue building a winning culture and a winning program, football program at UCF. Ashley and I feel like we have found a home in Orlando with the UCF community. I look forward to an extended tenure of creating a football program that matches the vision of university leadership, including President Hitt and Danny White, yada, 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 yada. yada. So this was interesting, wasn't it? What do you think? Contract extension through 2021 after... One season. I should note, George O'Leary got a contract extension after uh, after the bowl season, after uh, the the first bowl season, the year after 0 and 11. Yeah. After 2000. Ten, what was it, like a 10 year extension or it was something? A ten, like yes, it was a 10 year oh, contract boy. extension. They locked him up. And I got a, some fu- uh, some interesting things that I remember about that time that I that I heard from a few people. But um, but here you go. Scott Frost locked up through 2021. Uh, no, I haven't seen anything about his buyout changing. I think his buyout still might be pretty cheap. Um, last I saw, I think it was, what was it? $850,000. Um, looks like he's getting a little bit more money to go to his, uh, assistance as well. But, um, what do you think about this signing this extension right now? What does this mean? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if it's like a big deal, um, I might have even said this in the uh, podcast in December. I think when we talked about the Oregon job opening, I, I think I might have said even I wouldn't be surprised if this leads to Scott Frost getting an extension. Because uh, usually if your name's thrown out there for other jobs, I, you know, that kind of gives you some leverage. And then all of a sudden, hey, you know, get a good job done. You get an extension. Um, I think a lot of this, is, I mean, coaches always like to do this stuff for recruiting purposes. That's what I've been told. 
But, like, did anybody expect him to leave, like, anytime soon? Like, if he didn't announce the extension, like, this week, was there, like, did anybody have concerns? Like, so I'm always I think interested. some people did, right? But does that, yeah, but here's the thing. Does that change your opinion now? Oh, okay, he just signed his extension. He's definitely staying. I mean, I, I don't feel comfortable. It's always interesting. I mean, and it's not just him. It's I'm, I'm fascinated by college athletics in that every coach gets extension every year, it seems like. Whereas you don't see this in pro sports, right? Like Bill Belichick's not getting another extension just because he just won another Super Bowl or Greg Popovich isn't going to get another extension if he leads the Spurs to a title. This always happens in college athletics, uh, which always is fascinating to me. I mean, we see Nick Saban got an extension. Uh, Jimbo Fisher manipulated the whole LSU situation with his agent to get extensions. Uh, Jim McElwain and all that. So it always fascinates me of why the need – to give somebody an extension every other year, it seems like. And the answer is obviously is they're worried about recruiting, right? Well, this is well, all there's about also a lot of, there's also a lot of competition. And I think that's true right. among all levels of college football. Like what's UCF's competition for Scott Frost? Well, it's probably a, uh, well, it's a, it's a big five conference school, right? They're worried about someone poaching him. Now you mentioned Saban and I think Saban was an interesting case study because you know by by all accounts he's at the top of the of the mountain in terms of college football why does he get an extension well because texas was sniffing around um you know there's there's a lot more competition for coaches for good coaches um in college football than there is uh in the nfl because you know the nfl is the apex what's the higher level you're going to go to there right like you know if you're bill belichick you know what's the what's the competition to snatch you out of new england there's none. Yeah, but if you're Bill Belichick, couldn't you just say, well, maybe I'm thinking of retiring. Maybe well, I'll try a different to seek thing. a new challenge, and then you could work in negotiations that way. It's just very interesting. Uh, like, I never – I don't think my opinion changes one way or the other on Scott Frost. Like, I don't think – if you have the opinion that Scott Frost might lead for a Power 5 job, I don't think this extension changes your opinion on it, does it? Like, or if you think Scott Frost is going to stay – for the long run, I don't think all of a sudden signing this extension, all of a sudden, like, you know, oh, yeah, see, I told you so. I mean, things change. Life changes, right? Like, who knows what happens in a year or two years or three years from now? Um, you know, good for him. You know, he worked. The, he's got a new deal. You got to staff more uh, money. If there's more security. I definitely think there's a recruiting aspect to this because you're recruiting kids a couple years, you know, not only for this upcoming year's class uh, in 2018, but beyond and. I'm sure that's you know people are always asking, are you going to stick around for my four years play, right? And now you have this press release that's out there to show your recruits, hey, I'm here till I'm signed until 2021, right? Isn't that isn't that really what this is more about? I, well, from UCF's perspective, yes. I think the other the other thing also, and and there are some um, numbers that came out with the contract, the Orlando Sentinel here with the report. Uh, his one-year extension bumped his salary from one point seven to two million dollars. Even his assistant coaching salary pool jumped by fifty thousand dollars. That's not overly much. Um, Frost buyout clause is one half of the guaranteed salary for the remaining term of the contract, or three million dollars. So that so so it's, so it looks like that buyout clause got bumped up a little bit. So if someone's going to pry him out of UCF, it's going to take right. a little bit more money than it did previously. I think that there was a there there is a part of me that says that the original contract that he signed um was there was something I guess for lack of a better term experimental about it where look, we're going to see where this goes because this is your first head coaching gig and you know, it may go great. It may not. Um, if it does, if it goes great, if you show improvement, and if you know things go the way we expect them to do, you know, we'll we'll we'll, we'll talk extension right after this year. And you know, hey, six and seven, cure bowl, lost the game. I get it. But after last season's or the previous season's zero and twelve, just completely directionless debacle. Um, I thought that was a you know, I mean, we I think we both agree that you know he did a very good job of. Um, of turning the program around, getting it back in the right direction, um, but you know this this doesn't this tells me that maybe Scott Frost sticks around 
maybe one more year than he would have otherwise. Exactly how long he's going to stick around, I have no idea. Yeah, but 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 here's the thing though, and this is why I feel like it's a non-story. What if Scott Frost goes, let's say he goes eleven and one next this upcoming year? Does he you win know the conference he's title? A, yes. Let's okay. say he goes eleven and one, wins the conference. Let's say he goes to an all access bowl. His name's gonna be hot as a power five job anyway. Oh, yeah. So guess what? You're probably going to have to give him another extension, right? You're going to give another raise to try to keep him. We saw this play out in Houston with Tom Herman, right? Remember when Tom Herman led Houston to the Peach Bowl? They gave him this huge extension and this with huge a very, raise. A highly bonus-laden extension, too. Remember the $5 right, million right? Dollar bonus yes. for yeah. Houston getting into a, a, right. a power league? Correct. And then what happened a year later? He, he left for Texas. So yeah, he went my, he went to the power league and Houston didn't. <laughs> right. So I, I don't know. My whole point is it's just it's I, I don't know if I, I really make too much of it. Like, I don't really change my opinion. I think Scott Frost will stay here as long as he wants. You know what I mean? I don't think yeah. all of, it, you know, and who knows and you know what his thinking is. He might. It, I, I do think he wants to stay here a while. I. I, I don't see him as the type that's eager to bolt right away. I think he wants to build this program the right way based on the people he's been influenced by, like the Tom Osborne's of the world that kind of build stuff up. That being said, I don't think this exchange extension should change anybody's opinion one way or the other. It's just that it's, it's just, it always fascinates me how these college athletics make these moves in the off season. Um, is this some somehow this is some big news? Like I had no concerns that Scott Frost was leaving anytime soon after next year or anything like that. So yeah. um, you know, good for him. I guess the interesting question will be, <clears throat> for example, does Johnny Dawkins now get an extension? Yes, Do we get that's, oh, yeah. You know what I mean? That's an interesting right. I mean, question. and that, and that's and that's an interesting dilemma from an administrative standpoint, right? Is like how I don't do you think pick it should these? be a dilemma? No, but I mean, let's. I mean, I you know, I know that football is the care, you know, the one that carries the whole thing with money and all that. But you know, now all of a sudden, if you're, you know, does this open it up? Where hey, if you're Johnny Dawkins, where well, maybe I should get an extension. You know, uh, who, where does he, you know, then then the next coach could, you know, Greg Lovelady's doing a great job. So it's always interesting on how these things do. Obviously, I think you're right in that Denny White's very happy with Scott Frost, obviously, and I think he's very pleased with the direction of the program. Uh, but it's just kind of interesting how these things kind of one year in and hey, we're already working out on a new deal. And, <laughs> you know, it's always, uh, yeah, uh, I'm only, you know, it's always interesting. Like, I don't know where that, like, what other line of work does this happen where, you know, you, you're a year in and you get a new deal all of it or with the same company, basically, right? Like, probably uh, high level television network news. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Or yeah, like, no, I, high, or like I, high level CEOs. Maybe. Yeah, that's probably fair. Right. If you Maybe. bring in a lot of profits. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's just fascinating how some of the world uh, works like that uh, to, to that to that standpoint. You're right. I mean, it's fascinating to me. But hey, good for them. Good for them. I and like I said, um, I think it's I think there's a recruiting aspect to it, which is why I'm answering my own question. Why we don't see this in pro sports, because you don't have to worry about recruits in pro sports. Right. In college, you do, because that's part of the. Right. That's always I'm guessing that people that are recruiting against Scott Frost and UCF, the, the one of the arguments they will use, hey, don't go to UCF because he's not going to be there long. He's going to go to Nebraska. He's going to go this or that. Right. And so Scott, Scott Frost has to fight that just like other college coaches have to fight. Like you said, Nick Saban, whether you thought the Texas thing was legit or not, it was floated. So people will use that. And it is interesting. I feel like us media people help coaches get these extensions don't we because we float these coaches names to all these jobs which gives them leverage which i'm always fascinated about right well, like I, I, well, well see i i think what you're getting at see i don't think the media i mean the media does have some leverage on that although i don't think it's quite as much as you may say i i think what you're really saying is it's the agents that have the power because remember, yes. it's the oh, agents yeah. Oh, yeah. Are, oh, yeah. yeah, it's the agents that leak that stuff out to the but press, who are they, and then right. a report and who's, comes out. Right. The Saban, exactly. the Saban to Texas thing was the textbook example of that, and uh, you know where his his agent. I think it's Tom Condon. I could be wrong. Forgive me sure. if I am, but 
Um, but you know, kind of, kind of let it leak out there that hey, you know, Nick, you know, Texas is kind of sniffing around. Bang! Alabama locks them up to an extension. Well, I'll and, give you the better that's, example. That's the, the game the, that they play. It's the, the better example. So than the Prince. right. Oh, I agree. The better example is the Jimbo Fisher. The last two years at Florida State yes. with the LSU drama. Uh, now, Jimmy Sexton, I think, is the agent of Saban and, and Jimmy Fisher. Sexton, trying... That's right. I'm sorry. I said Tom Connor. He's that's the wrong. master. Jimmy He's Sexton. the master of this. Jimmy Sexton's the master of that. You float this stuff out there. Next thing you know, the New Orleans papers are reporting that Jimbo's the front guy and he'll take it. You know, And next thing you know, he gets an extension at Florida State. He decides to stay. And then a few days later, he gets an extension announced. You know? uh, but see, the media does play a role in that because we get sucked into this by the yeah. agent, right? Well, we just assume – that we're taking the agent for his word and we're not thinking, hey, we're getting played here. It's well, just that's, interesting. That's a, that's a juicy story. I mean, if so, if someone called you up and said, hey, you know, Texas is sniffing around with Saban. LSU right. sniffing around with Jimbo. You would you would jump at that story, too. I mean, well, it's, sure. it's part of the it's, uh, you know, all is fair and love and war and football coaching, apparently. But it just it reminds me, like with Scott Frost, his, his name got floated in the Oregon. And I think he even got floated for Minnesota. I'm like, there's no way he's going to Minnesota. Yeah. Like, where is that coming from? And, you know, the Oregon job, I understand why his name is floated there because of this connection to the program. But a lot of people believe that Oregon was going to go the complete opposite direction. So I don't know if he was ever a serious candidate. But his name was floated out there. People were concerned. And I remember, Scott, to the point where Coach Frost decided to come out and say, I'm not a candidate. I'm good. I'm happy here. And, you know, uh, so it's just kind of funny how gossip stuff uh, drives some of this stuff going on. Right. It's like, you know, the Nick Saban, the gym. It's, it's a very interesting it's driving up the it's price. It's driving yeah. up the price is what it is. And, you know, the agents, I mean, listen, if I was an agent, I'd do the same exact thing. Because they, you know, I'm getting, a, I'm getting what a ten percent cut of that, and if I can make a little bit and more I, money I that doing that way, I think right. I would and, do the same exact thing. And for the record, I don't blame coaches for this because it's a it's a two way street, right? If the coaches are struggling at five and seven or four and eight for a couple of years, they're going to get fired. So uh, the yeah, loyalty thing. I keep thinking thing, back to, it, uh, I keep thinking back to uh, Frost, so, uh, a guy that Frost knows, Frank Solich. Yeah. Remember Solich? And this was ten years ago. Solich at Nebraska went nine and three, I think, and they didn't make the Big Twelve wasn't good championship enough. game. Right. Wasn't good enough. Wasn't they fired good enough. him. Right? They fired him at nine and three. It's so like you know, if this if the business is that tough, then I'm gonna I'm gonna scoop up as many extensions as I possibly can. Yes. So yes. Um, so it's very 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 interesting industry from that standpoint. Yeah. It's, it's, but anyway, at, at any rate, Frost is uh, locked up through twenty twenty. Well, I say locked up. I don't know. Someone could. Here's the bigger. Okay, I will say this: one thing that gets lost in this, I do like the assistants getting a boost to keep that staff intact. I think is much, important. Wasn't really much of a boost though. Fifty grand is. Hey, hey man, look, anything helps. Hey, you hey, you want a snicker at fifty thousand? That's fine. I'll be more than happy to take well, a fifty thousand dollar raise. Thank well, you very much. Well, yeah. Well, no. Well, no. Remember that that's the that the pool was increased by fifty thousand. Right, so but still, spread a few that thousand. around ten guys, and you're talking about. An extra five grand. Well, that's okay. That's, I'll take it. Thanks. Thank yeah. you very much. If Not everybody can make Jeff Sharon's salary. That five thousand is <laughs> not a big deal. You know. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, well, I mean, it's you know, for some guys, it's it's, it's not exactly going to be bumping them up into the next tax bracket. But you know, <laughs> yeah. I, and remember, and but let's not forget. Listen, it's it's the officials or the officials. It's the um, it's the assistants that really drive the bus, and I not to not to downplay right. Scott Frost's and, work, no, but and, they're no, the ones who no. do the hard work, who are spending the long nights and the early mornings and sleeping in the yes, office on the yes. couch and all that. And those guys, I mean, and, and well, for, and Frost will tell you because he was an assistant coach for you know how many years prior to getting this job. You know, it, it, it's that's where you put in that's where you put in the grind, man. And those dudes grind well, and grind and grind. And the more money that they get them, the better, because those dudes deserve it, no question. Not saying Scott and, and doesn't. That, I'm saying those guys do. Right. And, and you know, you could say, well, 5000 is not a lot to maybe to an assistant, but it's, it's the it's – the, it's, but, yeah, the staff is, feels, shows that they're being taken care of. And I think that does mean a lot from the standpoint, hey, I don't need to jump and go to another job because, I, I, you know, people appreciate me over here. And I think the one thing is for uh, – sure, I think Scott Frost is a very loyal guy, don't you? Like, I feel like he is going – he's a very loyal guy to his staff and guys that will work for him. He's a very loyal guy. I, don't, I agree I, I with that. 
I agree and I think, come, and again, it comes from the whole Tom Osborne playing for him at Nebraska, who was a very believed in loyalty and things. I think Scott Frost is a very loyal guy, very loyal to his staff. And again, that's why I don't think he's leaving anytime soon, because I think he wants to at least get this program to where he believes it can go before if he is ever going to leave. I think it goes back even further than that. And evidence for that, for, from my perspective at least, is his offensive coordinator is Troy Walters. Troy Walters was a wide receiver at Stanford before Scott Frost even transferred to Nebraska. And they were friends from back then. And, you know, Walters obviously had a stellar Stanford career, went to the NFL. Frost also played in the NFL as a safety, not as a quarterback. But um, but th- that does sort of give you an indication, like you were saying, that sort of loyalty. He he does want to I, – I do believe that he does want to take care of his guys because he knows where his uh, bread is buttered, so to speak. So – um, again, congrats to, to Scott on the extension, um, and the and now the expectation game starts, right? <laughs> hey, well, I think it was going to be there anyway. We're ex- yeah, I know you went to a bowl game last year, but we were sub five hundred, and you know now that now this is going to start. Now we got to start thinking about conference championship. Now I got to start thinking about getting to a better bowl game, double digit wins, all those kind. Now those other milestones are going to start creeping up on them, aren't they? Well, I think that was going to happen regardless. So true, I, I think true. that that I, I don't think that all of a sudden the extension changes that. I think that was going to happen regardless. No, but that's going to be a talking point, though. Is hey, we you know hey, coach, you know you got that extension, and you know uh, we're looking. You know, I, I it's it, it, it yeah, you're right. It's going to happen anyway. But that was just one thing that I think is going to be interesting about it. You know, looking looking forward at it. Um, another thing I want to talk about with football, and uh, you know. At least that we turn as we turn our thoughts towards the NFL draft here. Um, the one UCF player was selected in the NFL draft. It was uh, Shaquille Griffin, selected in the third round by the Seattle Seahawks. Uh, he is the 36th UCF football player to hear his name called at the uh, at the NFL draft. Uh, pick number 90 overall. Uh, it was uh, Cliff Averill uh, who who had the distinction of announcing uh, Shaquille's uh, name for uh, the Seahawks. Some really great coverage of it on UCFNights.com. They had some uh, um, they had some uh, uh, cool video from the Seahawks war room. Uh, Pete Carroll on the phone with them and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I thought that was pretty cool. I was really um, pleasantly surprised. I thought that Shaquille. Would get drafted. I thought he would go day three. Uh, he goes day two to a team that, uh, I mean, we know how good Seattle's defensive system is. There's no question about that. And they're looking to get younger. And the, you know, I don't know if he's the best corner in the NFL, but certainly one of the best, Richard Sherman, uh, is by multiple reports and has been for a while rumored to be on the way out. Uh, of Seattle, they've been you know dropping hints that they might trade him because he's getting too expensive. Um, and and uh, if Sherman does go, that opens up an opportunity for Shaquille Griffin to get some playing time with the Seattle Seahawks. I think that there's not. I think that there could not have been a better spot for him to go. What do you think? Yeah, it's a good spot. He's going to learn from a lot of great defensive players there. I mean, defensive backs, Sherman. You've got safeties like Earl Thomas, Cam Chancellor. I mean, it's a pretty good group to learn. And, you know, that Seattle is, known, is the best, has been the best in the NFL for some time. Well, and the thing is, in Seattle, like you said, they will give you opportunities because one of the things that's made the Seahawks really a successful franchise since Pete Carroll's taken over is taking guys in the third and fourth round and turning mm-hmm. them into starters, uh, you know, and, and, and for good bargains. And I think he'll get his opportunities there and he'll learn from some of the best. So good for him. Good spot. No pressure right away. He can learn, kind of take his time and learn. And uh, he was on with Tuck and O'Neill actually this week. And uh, we might we should actually post that up, Jeff. Uh, yeah, that interview because he talked about meeting Pete Carroll and you know how uh, the process of getting to Seattle and it all started in the combine and having a great combine and and, and we're really happy for him to 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 land uh, there in the third round in Seattle in a great situation. Um, you know, good for him and, you know, great spot to learn from some of the best players in the league. Uh, I, I think he'll be taken care of very well. And, you know, Seattle's not a bad city to be uh, living in, right? I know. 
Not, although it's a long way from Florida, and it's going to be the first time he's going to be away from his twin brother, Shaquem, who's returning for his senior season. Shaquem redshirted. That's why, even though they're even though they're identical twins, separated by merely seconds, basically at birth, um, that you know that that's why Shaquem's coming back, and and Shaquille's going to be at the next level. A um, couple of notes I wanted to point out is Cam Chancellor, fifth round pick. Richard Sherman, fifth round pick. Uh, Shaquille's third round, so he's kind of he's kind of living high on the hog, probably <laughs> next to those guys saying, "Oh, you got picked in the third round." Okay, a um, couple guys that are ahead of him, at least on the on the depth chart right now. Uh, DeAndre Elliott, Nico Thorpe, and Jeremy Lane are the backup corners for Seattle right now. Um, uh, Shaquille did move himself up, I thought, with a really good combine. He was a late invite to the combine. He ran a four three eight forty which I think was a real big boost for him. It, it enabled him to, um, first of all, turn some heads, and people are like, oh, this, this Griffin kid out of Central Florida is pretty good. And I say Central Florida because that's what they say. But um, I'm, glad that they, I'm glad that they got that. And by the way, I'm glad Cliff Averill called us UCF when he actually called out the pick. That was pretty cool. And, well, there uh, you go. Yeah, and, uh, and you know, I mean, he, he, he was in the right spot, and now he's going to be in a good spot in Seattle. Hopefully they'll... Uh, Give him a chance to develop. And, and one other point that uh, that was brought up uh, to me um, by uh, Nate Blythe, uh, who uh, we were talking at the softball game last weekend. Special teams. Shaquille's an excellent special teamer. And oh, yeah. when you're in the position in your career in the NFL that he is right now, you have got to play good special teams. And uh, because that's the only way you're going to get on the field this first couple of years while you well before they entrust you with an entire side of the field as a starter. And so he's going to get the chance to shine on special teams. And I think that's where we're going to see him probably for the first, you know, year or two, see him as a special teamer on uh, kick coverage, um, maybe come in, in a couple nickel or dime situations. And then, uh, you know, if he's able to develop and get to the part where, you know, and, and, and really develop himself into the player that he wants to, that they want him to be, then we'll see him a little bit more once Sherman moves on, uh, maybe a couple other guys move on as well. So I think that's, that's always an underrated part. And I wanted to thank Nate for, you know, bringing that up because it's a great point that he made uh, to me and I wanted to pass that along. So good. But uh, a couple other things I wanted to point out. Um. A couple other guys out there for you. I saw a couple other names get picked up as undrafted free agents. Uh, T.J. Mutcherson, I think, got picked up by the Houston Texans. Uh, but I've got a piece on the Banneret right now that went up uh, earlier Thursday uh, morning. This uh, that We're recording it on Thursday evening um, on uh, Justin Holden. And uh, Justin did not get picked. He got a couple of sniffs pre-draft from the Atlanta Falcons. He was considered... Because he's from an, he's an Atlanta native, he was a local player. He came in uh, for when it, for the, the Falcons have like a local workout where they have guys from Atlanta or some from some of the schools around Atlanta um, come and come and take a look at him. There were some reports on the message board that he re, that he kind of turned some heads uh, for the Falcons. I think Jacksonville was also uh, showed a little bit of interest, but he didn't get picked up. He hasn't been signed yet. I'm actually a little bit surprised. I'm surprised that uh, a team hasn't at least brought him in, signed him to a rookie rookie tryout contract just to see what they've got. Because, you know, I really do think that Justin Holman has the tools to be, uh, at, 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 you know, it's certainly a, a pretty good backup to have in your hand. You know, big, big kid, 6'4", 225. We know how strong his arm is. Um, obviously, you can talk about his accuracy, but that's something that I think can be improved on. He certainly, uh, we, we certainly know how good of a dual threat he can be. He's definitely mobile. And uh, and also he has experience as a, as a starter, which is something that's quite rare when you look at some of the quarterbacks that are coming in out of the league. I mean, shoot, Mitch Trubisky, what, 13 starts under his belt? Uh, Justin Holman won himself a conference championship as a sophomore. And I think he got caught up in a couple things. Obviously, the injuries in, uh, in his junior year, he suffered the, the broken finger uh, in the 0-12 year, in addition to the fact that they just had no offensive line in front of him no skill position players, and no running game whatsoever to, to speak of. It was just a bad year on offense that was, I think, a lot of things can be explained away. Not really his fault. He was at, They asked him to do way too much. And then his senior year, in comes a new coach with a new system that doesn't fit him. So I think if you're an enterprising quarterback coach out there, I think he would be an interesting project 
to get a hold of. I thought actually Atlanta might be a pretty cool place for him to land if he could, you know, if they're the the backup to Matt Ryan's Matt Schaub. Schaub's been around for quite some time. Um, you know, he's not he, he's no spring chicken. If you could bring in Justin Holman, maybe put up stick him stick him in your back pocket as a as a practice as a practice squad guy, third string emergency quarterback. You could make him a pretty de- he he would make a pretty decent, I think, option for a backup quarterback, don't you? The problem is there's no room. I mean, look at the NFL right now. Jay Cutler is not signed. Uh, Colin Kaepernick's not signed. Uh, Ryan yeah, Fitzpatrick's not signed. Yeah, but those guys are expensive. Signed. Maybe they are. But then again, they're out there. They're not signed. My point is I think a lot of teams have pretty much set on their quarterbacks. And then you look at the draft and guys like Brad Kaya got taken in the sixth round. Uh, I think teams are kind of set at their quarterbacks. And I think the thing that hurts Justin is – doesn't matter how good your arm is. If you can't throw ac- accurately, uh, it's tough to make it in the NFL. So I, I think that's kind of – that's always been the big problem with him is he was never consistently accurate right. at UCF. And I'm guessing uh, that he didn't prove those critics wrong when he tried out because uh, he has an arm. I don't think there's a question. But if it's not accurate, I don't – the NFL, you, you, you must throw with accuracy. In you the NFL, throw it with through the, the keyhole, as uh, right as uh, and, and, uh, Michael Lombardi says. And if this, and if you don't show them that you're capable of doing that, then I don't think the NFL is going to, you know, take the time to uh, see if you could learn how to do. I, I, I don't think. I feel like most NFL executives would tell you that's not something that you can just learn all of a sudden to throw accurately in, in a certain spot. You either have it or you don't have it. Yeah. And, that's a uh, that's a fair point. That's a totally fair point, and I get. That. I think, and I made that point in the piece. The other thing, though, that that I that I kind of brought up, and maybe I'll write a little bit more on this a little bit later, is see, here's a perfect situation where the NFL's lack of a developmental league, and I know that there are plans for something like that happening soon, but the NFL's lack of a bona fide developmental league is kind of hurting the game. I think. Um, because a guy like, let, let's say the NFL had a D league, right? Well, I, well, I mean, stop, I'll, I'll, here's the argument. Okay. Some would argue they already do have that D league. It's called college, college football. Like, well, okay. Fair point. But, but Justin Holman's not play not playing in college anymore. Sure. One thing. And the other thing is these college, these college teams don't run NFL systems. So if we, if you had a bona fide developmental league where say each team had a triple a team somewhere and maybe it, could, it even could be like an arena league or something right like you know if the if the nfl set up an arena football league style developmental league where you could run a couple things and and, and just keep these players fresh i think justin Oldman would be a perfect candidate to get some playing time over there and, and at least give him the, the XFL. opportunity to the take, XFL. Take, 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 XFL, although they didn't was, want anything to do with the NFL, to be honest. No, but that's the problem. See, the problem is the NFL doesn't want to spend that money because they feel, hey, we'll just get one for free in college football. And then if a league tries to start up, whether it be the XFL or the UFL or the NFL, it's almost like, oh, no, how dare you challenge? You know, we're not the NFL and people kind of don't watch it. And then it folds. I, You know, the World League is another example. Well, that was uh, owned by the uh, by the NFL, the and NFL Europe in the World League sure. was owned by the right. NFL and and worked for a while, uh, the, and then the NFL dropped it, and then the NFL dropped it because there was an economic downturn at the time, and and it became expensive to right. to administer these teams a third of the way around the globe. Right. So, uh, I, I you know I don't think the NFL it's going to take you know what it's going to take. It's kind of like what happened with the NBA. You see, the reason the NBA decided to do the D League is because of all the one and done kids and all the freshmen. And even before that, when the kids were coming out of high school and then everybody's like, whoa, I mean, we need to like come up with some system here if we could develop some guys here because uh, we're taking a lot of potential guys. But we need bodies. And I think that's what it's going to take is see if the NFL, if college football ever got to the point like the NBA or like college basketball where you had a bunch of one and dones. I think that would put pressure on the NFL to come up with that farm system. But I think the NFL is comfortable with the way the system is set up right now, where the college kids basically got to be in there three years, mm-hmm. you know, whether it be three straight years of playing or two years in a red shirt. So they feel like they're already kind of what they are and that you're not going to get that much better moving forward. 
Uh, but I agree with you. I mean, it'd be good if Justin had another league, an arena league, or a, or maybe not a real league because it's a, such a different – although Kurt Warner was very successful, and he got his opportunity in yeah. the NFL because of, of his success in arena football. So let's not uh, diminish arena football. Like, you can't develop in arena football and go into the NFL. Rondé Gatson, a great receiver – uh, with the Dolphins, Dolphins was a great yeah. football, right? So it, it, more opportunities, I think, is what you're saying that needs to be out there. But it's tough because there's – who's going to fund those leagues? Where is the advertising dollars going to come from? There's just a lot of different fra- deals that for – you know, that people just don't want to invest into it like the NBA does. There was a report in December from Sirius XM NFL Radio. Pat Kerwin reported that um, – the NFL will have a spring league starting in – actually, the, the, he said the spring of this year, structured around four squads of veteran free agent players. The NFL um, – now, since then, we haven't heard anything about it. There were right. other reports that said that the spring league is not affiliated with the NFL, but an official developmental league for the NFL will probably happen within a few years. That was John Heath who said that. Jason Lock and Fora uh, has said that uh, – uh, you know, it, in December that the NFL league office wants to push for a developmental league and or academy in the owners meetings. Um, it just seems like it's something that they keep talking about, but never actually happens. There's something called the spring league, which was created in early 2016 to serve as an instructional league. Um, th- that's plays by the NFL rules. It's just, the coaches are in favor of it. And I know that the players' union is certainly in favor of it because that's you know more jobs for guys. But um, but it, they just never seem to be able to do it. If it is going to happen, it's going to have to be the NFL who actually does it, right? Um, it, 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 it's not going to be an independent thing like the UFL was. I mean, that was that was the most recent and most quote successful end quote recent attempt at a developmental league. Um, it was, it, which was a real bummer that that that, worked, that, that didn't work out. But th- th- there were some things with that that could have worked. There were guys who were, you know, I mean, Dante Culpepper himself was a player in that league for a while. I think Jeff Garcia was in there. Guys who were just trying to keep themselves sharp, who were free agents out there, who still had gas in the tank. And then you had the other younger guys who were undrafted. And if you set up a league where, um, where you, you, you know, you're, you're, hiring coaches and you're keeping guys who you can kind of call up to the big club or down. See, with the new CBA, the other thing is, too, with the injuries that we're starting to see now because of the reduced practice time, that means that there's a lot more turnover, too, Elo. And and when that happens, you got to have guys that are going to be ready to fill in. So I think that with the new CBA, with the new rules about practices and 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 protocols and all that kind of stuff, you're going to see a lot more churn on the rosters and – Coaches and GMs are going to want fresh guys who are versed in the systems in there. And if that means that eventually the NFL does get a developmental league um, that enables those guys to stay fresh, to get, to be immersed in their systems and immersed in their coaching staffs and all that kind of stuff, I think that they'll be that, – that, that, that's fine with them as far as they're concerned, but it's just a matter of the NFL coming up with the investment, 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 investment. It's happened because there are, some, there are guys out there, like I said, like Justin Holman that deserve a shot like that. Who's passing the buck? Yep. I don't know, man. Someone's going to have to come up with that money. But yep. eventually, I, 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 think, I, if, I think if they're smart, if they really care about the, the, the quality of the game, I think that's going to happen eventually soon. And, and if it does, hopefully, maybe we'll get a franchise here in Orlando. Who knows? Yeah, we maybe always we'll do. Some, maybe we'll get some UCF guys in there that we can see them for a little bit longer. So, All right. Let's, uh, let's take a quick breather. And uh, when we get back, we'll talk uh, baseball. We'll talk softball, Eric Lopez, and uh, we'll talk about a little men's golf and uh, tennis action with the uh, tournament coming up uh, pretty soon. Stick around. Black and Gold Banner at Podcast is back after this. Hello, Night Nation. I'm Andrew Fegley. And I'm Trey Strelko. Um, uh, um, where are we? This isn't our usual spot. It looks like we've landed in the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. Oh, yeah. I've, I've heard of those guys. 
You know, Nightline has UCF Sports covered. Week in and week out, we bring you interviews with newsmakers and in-depth analysis of UCF Sports. Subscribe to our weekly podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Be sure to subscribe to Nightline on YouTube, like us on Facebook, and follow us on Twitter at UCF underscore Nightline. Trace, can we go back to the 1148 studios now and start working on our next all-new Nightline? How do we get out of here? Go Knights! Charge on! Now back to you guys in the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. And welcome back to the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. A quick reminder for you, you can hit us up on blackandgoldbanneret.com uh, and hit us up on Twitter as well, which is where we share a lot of stuff that we're thinking at that particular moment. I'm at Jeff underscore Sharon. Eric Lopez is at Eric Lopez Elo. Black and Gold Banneret itself is at UCF underscore Banneret. We are also on Facebook and Google Plus, Black and Gold Banneret. And look up uh, this podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, Google Play, and tune in. Tell your friends. Leave us a review. Let us know how we're doing. Don't be afraid to reach out to us on Twitter and ask us anything you want to talk about. Um, we certainly want to hear from you guys about that. All right. Let's uh, move right along. Oh, I thought this was pretty cool, Eric. Uh, we'll get to some baseball and softball in a second. But uh, two UCF Knights teams, this is according to UCFKnights.com, are among the best in the nation on the acad- and the NCAA's academic progress rate, uh, which means that they have to have sc- uh, scores in the top 10% of... Uh, uh, to be an academic performance program, a team must have posted multi-year academic progress rate scores in the top 10% of all squads in each sport. It is the sixth consecutive year for women's tennis to be recognized, so congratulations to them. And also UCF football uh, earned recognition from the NCAA academic performance program so uh, a job well done for uh, women's tennis and football with the APR uh, public recognition uh, awards uh, let's do baseball so uh, 31 and 14 nine and six and a five way tie for first place Eric Lopez are the UCF baseball Knights uh, even though they're coming off of a two to one loss at North Florida the Knights did take two out of three uh, against Memphis last weekend they head to New Orleans for a three-game set uh, with Tulane, which is actually of the five teams at nine and six in the conference. Tulane's the worst, actually. They're they're actually below five hundred overall, but uh, Tulane uh, still there in conference play. Uh, and then here's the schedule: how the sh- schedule shakes out. After that, it's at Miami on Wednesday, May the tenth. Three-game set at Cincinnati, twelfth, thirteenth, fourteenth. So that this is. This is, uh, let's see, when you count the North Florida game, that's eight in a row on the road, nine in a row on the road when you count their May 16th Tuesday tilt uh, at FAU down in Boca before they finish the regular season against USF and get ready for the conference championship. But uh, um, you see a baseball right now, I think, in pretty good in pretty good straights. But, man, nine and six, and there's four other teams at nine and six. What kind of a mess is this going on right now? It's wild, and this is a big series. So I mean, this is where you, this is where tiebreakers come into play, and you know you're trying to eliminate some of your competition by hand and keep your uh, positioning as far as at least an at large for the NCAA tournament and trying to maybe win the conference regular season title. Tulane's been a weird team; they've struggled out of conference, mm-hmm. but they've done very well in conference. That's not an easy play to uh, place to play in New Orleans. Of note, the Sunday game will be on the American Digital Network. So uh, I get a chance to see them there uh, as far as video is concerned. Um, it's a big series. And, you know, they lost a tough one at North Florida. You know, North Florida's a good team, though, after winning two, two out of three. Yep, yep. Two to one ball game. And uh, look, it's a big game, big road trip. I think uh, it's an important road trip because, again, the goal is you win the series and move on. And, you don't want to be starting to slide a little bit, and that RPI starts to dip a little bit. It's in the, I think it's 34 right now, but it's a big series. It's a great opportunity for the team and uh, to take another step closer to moving up in the standings. Where goal is, you know, by the time you get to that USF series, you, maybe the regular season title could be in play. I think that's the goal, and uh, but not easy. Cincinnati's improved, uh, and in their situation, the weird thing about it is. The game at Miami, which is a significant game from the standpoint that will mark Greg Lovelady's return to Miami. Greg Lovelady played at Miami, was a two-time national championship. 
And so that would be unique. But what's bizarre is Miami's not very good this year. They are struggling. Right. They are they are in serious jeopardy of missing the NCAA tournament for the first time ever. Like ever. It, it, that just ever? doesn't happen at Miami. Ever. Ever. Like we're maybe going back to the seventies or something. Uh, I think was the Old last time enough. they missed the NCAA <laughs> tournament. Yeah, you go. I, I, I can't believe that. Ever. It's oh, been wow. a while. Uh, go well, ahead. The Sunset, well, the Sun Sentinel just reported this uh, actually earlier today. They, they, Miami has a – this is unbelievable. Miami has the, uh, a 44-year postseason streak. Yeah. 44 seasons in a row. That's unbelievable. That's, and it is, it's, it's 2017. And it I'm doing the math. That's 1973. Yeah, to put that in perspective, Don Shula is uh, in the process of winning his second Super Bowl in Miami Whew. in the NFL. Uh, UC- <laughs> UCF was not even thought of at that point, right? I mean, I mean it's just nuts. Uh, the Knicks were actually a championship contender and won titles back then in the NBA. Uh, won the title that year in 1973. <laughs> right. But how crazy is that? 44 years. Wow. So I guess it wasn't ever, but it seems like ever. Uh, 25 it, that, college World Series appearances, four yeah. national titles. And they're in trouble. They're in serious trouble. Their RPI, you look at the record right now, win, loss, and RPI. They're in serious trouble. It's not looking good for them. Miami's going to be a desperate team against UCF in that Wednesday. And it's a very awkward situation. It reminds me a lot of the UCF-Connecticut basketball game. Uh, when we talked about it during the year where Connecticut had a down year, they weren't very good. Their RPI wasn't very good. They weren't going to go to the NCAA tournament, but it's still Connecticut. And and it was just still a challenge for UCF. And that's it's a no-win situation because then UCF lost to Connecticut. It's like, oh, geez, how could you lose to Connecticut? But it's not like it's at Connecticut. And so it's the same thing. It's a tricky situation there. Um, interesting road trip, to say the least. I think uh, if they can do well on this road trip, then I think the they will – lock up at least an at-large bid for the NCAA. If they struggle in this road trip, I think UCF now maybe plays themselves into the bubble. That's how important this road trip is. It should be noted, by the way, Eric, UCF right now 34 RPI. USF is the highest-ranked team in the American at 30. Houston's at 32. Uh, Miami is, where are they? There they are, 68th. They're 22 and 22. Overall, wow. so wow, how the mighty have fallen. By the way, in case you were wanting to know, number one, it's a must Oregon win State. for Miami. How yep. weird is that? By the way, that is a must win for Miami <laughs> against UCF. Yeah. When's the last time? Who'd have thought that would have been said? I don't know. I never. I, I remember I did a. Uh, gosh, it must have been about eight years ago. I uh, filled in for Mark Daniels doing a uh, UCF baseball game uh, against Miami, and they throttled us. Um, I think they scored like nine runs in the first two innings or something. Chris Duffy had a home run that kind of chipped into it. But, man, did Miami beat the tar out of us that game. I was like, man, that's Miami. I mean, we grew up, you know, uh, in South Florida with yeah. uh, knowing how good Miami baseball was. And to see them in, in the straights that they are now, it's just, it's just, it's, it's, I, I don't know, man. It, it's, it's like bizarro world seeing that. Miami is at 68th of the RPI and they're at 500. Here's UCF at 31 and 14. 26 and 8 at home. Um, man, those three losses to South Florida really do hurt, you know, at this point, don't they? Yeah, but that happens in baseball. I mean, South Florida's a good team. I mean, let's I mean, you get, you're going to get another shot at them, but you know, but but now you're in a position where if you're if you're tied with them heading into the heading into that final weekend, you got to sweep them. Now you're at home, but Shoot, man, that's that's a that's a tough ask against a team that's that's also you know like well, you, said, you just gotta good. worry about one game at a time, and you just kind of worry about. It. But let's see what happens here first at Tulane. It's gonna, yeah, I, I, yeah, and that's gonna go a long way to determining uh, what happens with UCF again. That's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday at Tulane, uh, and you can hear those games uh, on uh, the nice flagship iHeartRadio. And uh, 96.9. And I think there's also something going on with the American Digital Network as well. Keep an eye on UCFKnights.com for the latest on that. All right. Over to the other diamond. Softball. 27-21. and 21, 9 and 6 in the league right now. Eric Lopez. Uh, the Knights have... 
Uh, just three more games. Uh, three more games left. They got won the uh, doubleheader uh, at Bethune, uh, sweeping the Wildcats up in Daytona. Two out of three against UConn, and what a thrilling way to cap off um, Senior Day uh, against the UConn Huskies for UCF. Now I know you're going to look at that and say, "What are you talking about, Jeff? They won nine nothing in six innings." Well, here's how it ended. Brewer drills it to deep right field. Can you say Brew Shot? It's a grand slam. Brewer style. See ya. Ball game over. Cassidy Brewer sends the seniors off on a winning note with a grand slam. And the Knights win it. Nine to nothing. So how about Cassidy Brewer, man? Two homers in that game, including the walk-off grand salami. Not a bad way to cap it off. You know, she's not a senior. But uh, what a gift to give to the seniors right there with that with that win on uh, on the home diamond. Well, it was a very historical game for Cassidy Brewer. Two home runs, six RBIs in the game. Yep. The six RBIs is tied for the second most in program history, uh, tied with a bunch of players. In fact, Brittany Solis was the last one to do it in Stetson in 2015. The record in the program is Stephanie Best, who had 11 RBIs. Yep. In yep. 2003 against Army, which is still an NCAA record. And it's so, a game that we remember uh, from, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I know that, unfortunately, that day I wasn't there, but uh, our friend Andreas Butler was, and he he actually called that game. <laughs> and and uh, that was when Steph had, what, what, she had two grand slams in one inning? Correct. So uh, I, Correct. She had three home runs, which is also the school record. Cassidy's yep. two is tied for second. Uh, cool. But it tells you what a great day it was for Cassidy uh, and big punch. She's just, she's turning into a tremendous player, leads the team at homers, RBIs, maybe the best pure hitter on the team right now and catching. Uh, she's been big, really big good behind the plate this year. I, I think that's, right, that has not been discussed enough is how how well she settled. Because remember where it was for a little bit, I think, what was it? Uh, was it Courtney Roten was behind the plate for a little bit at the start of the year? Autumn Gillespie. Autumn Gillespie. Yeah, Autumn. I'm sorry about that. Autumn was back there, and uh, and and Cassidy kind of stepped in, and he, she's been doing it with the bat of late, and she's been doing it through in the field particularly. So, um, uh, uh, she's really turning into. Uh, I think she's really emerging as a star right now for UCF softball. No question about it. Uh, and then you know, so they get two out of three against Connecticut. Might have thought uh, it was good to see on uh, Manami Calexto step up, get some quality innings there for them. Uh-huh. Uh, on senior the day, sweep. on senior day, very yeah. nice touch there. They mentioned the sweep against Bethune Cookman in the midweek doubleheader. That's a good confidence booster. Now you go up to Tulsa though against the top twenty-five team in the country, the team that just wrapped up the regular season title in the league in Tulsa, who's going to be the number one seed in next week's conference tournament in Greenville and probably is going to be the team they're going to have to go through uh, uh, to get the title. Mm-hmm. So it'll be a good challenge for them going into the tournament against the top team like Tulsa and they're going to have to be at their they're they're going to have to play their best. Tulsa is going to have as the best pitcher in the conference and Emily Watson is going to win pitcher of the year and they have a very balanced offense. So this will be a challenge for that young Knights team there to go on the road at Tulsa which is not an easy place to play back I would argue that Tulsa is probably in the conference the toughest place to play and win just because uh, Tulsa is such a good fit in that stadium that 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 ball, if that wind's blowing out, it's a, it turns into a home run part. But at the same time, if the wind's not blowing out, it's hard to get it out of there. So it, it's 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 what it's a very tight stadium and uh, it'll be a bit of a challenge for them. Not easy to get directly to Tulsa. So uh, it, it'll be a challenge, but a good challenge for this team to see where they're at uh, going into the conference tournament with a lot of implications. UCF could still finish as high as a two seed for the conference tournament with some help or a three seed. Uh, if, for example, Houston, who hosts South Florida this weekend, if Houston beats South Florida, let's say Houston sweeps South Florida, then UCF will be the three seed. If Houston, let's say, wins two out of three and UCF, wins a game or two at Tulsa, then UCF will be the three seed. Uh, so they would need Houston to probably lose two or three games just to be the two seed. On the other hand, if things don't go well for UCF, the lowest they can be is a four seed in the conference tournament, and they would play the five seed in the opening round. Right. 
And uh, I- important to note that there are seven teams that play softball in the American. Going to be eight next year at mm-hmm. Wichita. Wichita has softball, right? Yeah. So. Yep. Um, so so you're looking at and, and the way this the tournament is seeded. If you're the top seed, you get the buy, right? Yes. So yes. Tulsa will have the buy. They're going to be the number one seed. So they'll get a buy into the semifinal, and they will play the winner of the four versus five. Which right so for now example, would be USF and Memphis. Correct. But that could change after this weekend. It could be UCF and Memphis. Mm-hmm. So that's what I'm saying. I think UCF could end up seeing Tulsa again next weekend. Uh, but that's the story. So right now the two would play the seven, which right now it looks like Connecticut could be the seven seed unless they sweep Memphis, which I don't see happening. And then the three seed would play the six seed. Right now that would be East Carolina is the six seed who's the host. So right. uh, that's how the tournament would break out. It'll be all finalized by Sunday. But uh, it's an important weekend from a sh- uh, scheduling conference seeding standpoint. Now, not not talked about enough, I think, Eric, is the fact that this is a single elimination tournament. Yep. Now, baseball is a double elimination tournament. They have two four-team brackets yep. that are double elimination, and then the winners of the two brackets play in the championship game. Doesn't matter how many games you lost prior yep. to that. The winners of the two brackets play in a one-game winner-take-all championship on the Sunday in baseball. In softball, it's not like that. Every game, It's single elimination the whole way. Do you like that? That's uh, that's a heck of a question there. Uh, you know, a lot of the leagues in softball have done single elimination. The reason they do single elimination, and they won't admit it publicly, but it's it gets for the tournament over with real quickly. Well, it's that, and it's television. Like, for example, the American Conference Championship game is going to be on ESPN on Sat that Saturday. Mm-hmm. Well, if you have a double elimination tournament, you run the risk of that altering the schedule with if necessary games and stuff like that. And that kind of, TV doesn't like that. See, uh, that's fact, where the could, American did it right, by having the championship game be a, a single game between the winner of two brackets. In baseball, you're talking in ba- about. Yeah, in baseball, that's right. But in softball, I feel like they could do that. And and because I, I know that they've had double that they've had double elimination, at least UCF has played in leagues where they've had double elimination before. And, yeah, 2007 uh, in Conference USA was yep. the last time UCF participated in a double elimination tournament. Now, not every here's the, the other problem is everybody wants to get in in the conference tournament where a double elimination tournaments back, you know, if you only had a certain amount of teams that mm-hmm. plays in the conference tournament, you could do double elimination. See, for example, like the SEC, 12 teams make the SEC tournament. Well, you can't do double elimination with 12 teams. It'll take forever. Um, so that they do single elimination. What's interesting is the big 12 in softball this year, which is returning, they're going the baseball model in that they're doing pool play. So they're bringing six teams in for softball into the region, uh, to their tournament, break them into two pools, and then they play, uh, they're, av- they're automatically guaranteed to play three games. The team that has the best records of each pool play for the championship game. It's very interesting mm-hmm. that they have gone that route. Um, but no, a lot of this is... It's almost like the Olympics when they do that. Right. So, you know, it, 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 you know, I've seen it work on both ways. I see the arguments on both sides. I've, I've been in part of both of them. Uh, I do know that telev- from a television standpoint and a scheduling standpoint, uh, single elimination is what it's the preference. Uh, I, I'm okay with doing double elimination tournament personally. Uh, but I think if you're going to do that, you can't let everybody in in the conference tournament. You're going to have to shrink the teams in the tournament, and I don't think teams, coaches, and the leagues don't want to do that. So I thought I don't see single elimination going away, uh, but, you know, I, I've been a part of both, so I, I understand both sides. I don't know if I have a strong preference either way, except for the fact that, uh, you know, it's it's you, you, you have a set schedule. Because I've been in double eliminations where in 2007, this is an example – UCF forced an if necessary game against East Carolina, and they had to play that on Saturday before the nationally televised championship game was scheduled. Mm-hmm. And then what happened was that UCF East Carolina game went 12 innings, which ruined the television. The television started later because the semifinal game went 12 innings, and then they had to play the championship game. So that's why they've gone the single elimination tournament is to avoid that kind of conflict. 
See, I think you could still pull it off, especially if when you when you get Wichita in next year. I think you could pull it off where you do it the same way that baseball does it. You say, okay, Sunday, May you know, 12th or whatever it's going to be is the championship Sunday. We're only going to play one game, and it's going to be the, between the two winners of two four, the, the winners of two four-team double elimination brackets. And you could play, because it's softball and it doesn't take as much time as baseball, you, you could have all eight teams play in, in the first two days and then have the championship in day four. You could get it done in one weekend. Um, you know, you, you have every, you, you're going to eliminate some people after, uh, you know, I think you're going to basically end up eliminating half the field um, after the first two days. The third day is kind of your semifinal where you would have the, um, the, where you would determine the bracket winners and you could do the if necessary game, um, you know, the, you, you, based on however many games that you could play, but you could play four games in one day. And then, and then on that, and then the final day, after you find out who your two double elimination winners are, then you can have that championship game on noon on national television. You don't have to worry about that. And you could get it done much sooner because you can play so many games in softball that much quickly. I wish so they when, would do that personally. Because, when are you, wait, wait, so when would you start the tournament? Uh, you would start it on a Thursday. What right. happens if you get rain? What happens if you get rain in one of those two days? Oof. Well, well that's, now you're in a mess. That throat, you know? yeah, that throat. Well, that's well, and, and remember, selection Sunday is on that Sunday, and all of the games have to be done by early Sunday. In other words, you can't just wait around till Sunday night to get the game okay. in. You can't. So okay. there, there's that, there's that added pressure. Like baseball, for example, their selection show is not until Monday. Yeah. So you can wait till late Sunday night to get your game in. That's okay. not the case in softball. So, so all right, so push it back one day. You go Wednesday, right. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and you have your right. championship game. You know, after you know Saturday afternoon, but it's the only game on the slate. If you have, you know, but and let's say you could you could play that game on say, and, and let's say you do have rain. Okay, you could still finagle the schedule because you can get more games in. You can still finagle the schedule to fit in an extra game at night on the following day keep uh, in and, mind also on, by, and also on the day before the championship as well. Keep in mind, there is a rule, NCAA rule. A team is not allowed to play three games in one day. Yep. I mean, that's, so, that's, that's you know, fine. That, that's, just keep that in mind when you make these schedules. The other reason I don't see this happening is uh, teams don't want to go 0-2 in a tournament and kill their chances of making postseason. And uh, that's something that the – and that's why you've seen a lot of pull play being used in baseball, for example, because teams are trying to avoid, oh, you went 0 and 2. That's going to cost you a bid. Uh, but oh, I, I don't see it happening. I think they're going to keep it in the single elimination, but, uh, certainly I could give you more information when I join you from Greenville next week that's on right. the podcast. That's right. There's a nice plug. You know, I think, well, I think the, I think the likelihood of that would, would diminish, you know, if you do the four games in the first two days model, because each team would only play once. The only opportunity, you, the only time you would get a double header would be is it would be on the third day, in in, in, in awesome. and it would be one of those if necessary situations. That hey, listen, I, I I will say that again. I'm all for the I'm, I'm okay with the double elimination tournament as long as you limit the amount of teams that make the field. Because I remember in 07 that that was exciting to find out who's going to make the field for the tournament. Whereas now, because just about everybody's included, there's not that suspense. So. Uh, I, I'm okay if you're going to go double elimination, but I think you got to shrink the teams in. Like, I don't like, so for you example, would go down I, to like six out of eight then. Yeah. Yeah. Four or six. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and then do, and then you could do a tournament where you do like the, the two, the two pools right, of like, three. Right. Here's what you did. Like 2007, for example, the last time, you know, the top two seeds got a buy and then three played six, four played five in the first day. And then the winners of those two games played the, you know, the top two seeds, and they move and go from there. That way you're rewarding the team that wins the regular season and maybe even the team that finishes second if you want to do that. Uh, I just think that, that, you know, with, with, with a sport with as much randomness to it as softball is that, you know, if you're going to be handing out an automatic bid, I would like the, the best team to have the best team in the conference in the regular season, like you said, to have the best opportunity for it. Because, you know, Tulsa has one bad game on their home field. They're out. And... 
Yeah, right, yeah. next week in or in Greenville. Right, they don't even they really don't get anything outside of a buy, which is good, yeah. but they don't they get a buy. And then that's another interesting topic that maybe we'll get into more next week is, you know, should the regular season champion just host the tournament see, instead that's of the way just randomly to... picking spots? Yeah, you know? and that's... See, that some conferences do do that, and I actually like that, but that can be a real logistical nightmare, uh, especially if you're coming down to the last weekend and you got to, and then. All of a sudden, you're finding out, you know, on Sunday night whether or not you're hosting a tournament, you know, two or three days later. You know, sure, sure, right, right. So, I mean, that's, that's it is what it is. Uh, but they're not changing it any. I don't, I don't anticipate it being changed, and uh, I think it's going to be single elimination. And uh, yeah, I mean, it is weird that softball has gone this route. But again, I'm telling you, television is a big, big influence in this. If television was not in play, I think you would see more double elimination tournaments. But because everybody wants their championship games to be shown on television mm-hmm. or in the SEC's case, have every conference tournament game being shown on television, they will not do double elimination because that's a nightmare from a television scheduling standpoint. Yeah, I, I do agree with you on that. If you're going to have a championship game, I think the way you schedule a tournament is if you, you start with one championship game on one day at a specific time mm-hmm. and then you just mm-hmm. work your way backwards from there. All right, yeah. uh, let's flip to golf, men's golf. You know, they had the um, – they were the one seed in the tournament, uh, came up short, USF was the championship tournament, but Bryce Waller's team is heading to the NCAA Regionals in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. It is the sixth time UCF is heading to the NCAA Regionals in Bryce Waller's eight years, so congratulations um, to UCF men's golf, currently ranked 47th in the nation, according to golfstat.com. They will be the eighth seed in the uh, in the regional. Uh, the Grove will be hosting it, hosted by Mid Tennessee, Middle Tennessee uh, State, and uh, 81 total teams participating in these six NCAA regional uh, championships, May 15th through the 17th. Um, this is from uh, UCFKnights.com. Top five teams in each of the six regionals advanced, it, advanced to make it 30 teams playing in the NCAA championship round, which is scheduled for a, which is scheduled May 26th through the 31st at Rich Harvest Farms in Sugar Grove, uh, Illinois. We mentioned, of course, women's golf is heading to the Athens Regional. Uh, we mentioned that last night. Of course, they're currently 27th in the nation. Uh, that will be held uh, coming up. Next week, May 8th through the 10th in Athens, Georgia, at the University of Georgia uh, golf course. And then uh, we mentioned men's tennis. They're getting an at-large bid, baby. They're heading to the NCAA championships in Columbus, Ohio. They will play Friday, May the 12th. That's uh, um, next week, Friday, May the 12th. They've got number 43-ranked Louisville on the slate uh, on May the 12th, Friday at 11 a.m. local time. Uh, that is UCF men's tennis's uh, schedule uh, right there. So, so yeah, that's a busy day for uh, men's uh, for uh, for tennis and golf with the NCAA's coming around. That's right where we want to see them, and, uh, and and you know that's part of what the American Conference wants to see, right? We want to see. I don't think there's any yeah wanna, any question about that. No see, question. Want to just kind of I they want to run up the score with what we call the Olympic sports. They want to run up the score by getting as many people up there as humanly possible, as many American schools up there as humanly possible, and I think that's a good thing. And I and I hope that that continues to be part of the uh, of what we saw a little bit of. Uh, I'm going to write a little bit about this next week. The Power Six uh, idea that they the American is trying to push, and the initiatives that they're trying to push their schools towards in the next uh, several years. So, uh, all right, so. That will pretty much do it. What do we got coming up here for you, Eric Lopez? I know you're before you head over to uh, before you head up to Greenville for the uh, tournament. Yeah, well, let's make a note of that. Next podcast, I will be joining you, Jeff, from Greenville. I will literally be in Greenville. This will be a first. Uh, so I'll be We're live the at pot the pot on the road, baby. At least I am. Uh, you'll <laughs> still be in your home base, but yeah, I'll be, I will I'll be, be on the road the, in Greenville. Uh, I'll be back at the ranch here. I will be in Greenville, and uh, I'll give you the sights and sounds leading up to the conference tournament, which will begin on Thursday, May 11th. I will be part of the American Digital Network broadcast for the quarterfinals and the semifinals. So we'll have more details on that in the podcast next week. So make a note of that. It's a big one. 
Greenville Tournament, the softball tournament. Looking forward to a big preview of the softball tournament next weekend on the podcast. I'll be live in Greenville. That's the big thing to look forward to. I will be there. UCF softball, by the way, will be at Tulsa. The Friday night game, 6 o'clock, May 5th, will be on the American Digital Network. My good friend Bruce Howard, who I worked with last year, will be calling the game with Cindy Gerbach, former Houston player. She'll be the analyst in that game as well. So I uh, want to throw that out there for them. But, uh, yeah, that's really what I meant. I'm getting in game mode for a, a, another conference tournament. I've covered, uh, as we'll get into next week, uh, a lot of them. So you know, we should be excited. And make sure people follow you for all the latest information on that at? Eric Lopez Elo. That's where you'll get all the details and photos from Greenville and uh, who knows what else. But it'll be fun. All right. And I've, uh, and I've got, of course, uh, don't forget the piece that I've got up on blackandgoldbanneret.com. Right now on uh, Justin Holman and his N- and his NFL prospects. Uh, also, uh, don't forget to follow me at Jeff underscore Sharon and follow the banneret at UCF underscore banneret. We're also available on Google Plus and Facebook. Just look up Black and Gold Banneret. And uh, what else? We got? Oh, this podcast. Don't forget to tell your friends. Also, subscribe to us if you don't already on iTunes, SoundCloud, Google Play, and Tune In Radio. And uh, also, uh, don't forget to give us a uh, rating on iTunes as well. Give us a rating. Give us a little comment. Tell us how we're doing. And don't forget to reach out to us uh, at our respective places on Twitter and on our Facebook page. Again, just look up Black and Gold Banneret on Twitter as well. And go to blackandgoldbanneret.com and sign up for an email newsletter. Whenever we put up something new, you'll get it right to your email inbox right there. So, for Eric Lopez, I'm Jeff Sharon. Thank you so much for listening. This has been the Black and Gold Banner at Podcast. We'll catch you next week. Today's episode is brought to you by Cars.com. With over 2 million vehicles and 50,000 more added every day, Cars.com will match you with the perfect car for you, your budget, your life, your style. And if you're ready to say goodbye to your current car, Cars.com will get you an instant offer to cash it in. Just start by entering your license plate and get matched with a local dealer who will write you the check. So whether you're looking to buy or sell, just go to Cars.com. It's magical.